Welcome for the special edition of the Sunday show from the second largest city in Ukraine, Kharkiv. Less than 200 kilometers from the conflict zone, 40 kilometers from the Russian border. A very important hub for internally displaced and the Ukrainian military. So there is no surprise why the fourth Donbass Media Forum take place here. This is the largest conference where journalists discuss the recent and the most acute challenges the war creates not just for themselves, but the whole society. Escalation or ceasefire? What are the newest troubles for civilians living in the conflict zone, including the occupied territory? What would be the impact of the upcoming presidential and parliamentary election campaigns for the whole region? And what do we know about Serbian war criminals fighting for the Russian-backed separatists in the Donbas? In this program, our interviews with the journalists working in the field, principal deputy of the special monitoring mission of the OSC in the Donbas, as well investigative reporters from the Balkans, and our own reports from the territories where the Ukrainian army transcends its control. Today we're speaking about the conflict in Donbass very often just when there is an escalation, uh, but uh, that's important to remember that on a daily basis there are the sufferings of the uh, humans, there are the issue of the landmines, there are the issues of the everyday life. Um, however, we would like to know the general situation. What are the biggest challenges for the next years? Where we have to look? What's going on? Um, and to have this broader picture, we have with us Alexander Hook, who is a principal deputy and the chief monitor for the special monitoring mission of the OSC. Um, so thanks a lot, uh, us, for joining. So, um, you know, we usually speak when something happens, but now uh, can you give us broader understanding? We come into the period of what is called bread ceasefire. Uh, we are in the period when people are remembering four years after the um, freeing Slavyansk and Kramatorsk. So what we have been seeing this year is what we have been seeing last year, is what we have been seeing the year before, with different numbers to different degrees, but for the same reasons. Uh, and these reasons, the military technical reasons, continue to exist on the ground. What we see at the moment is that the sites maintain weapons, heavy weapons, tanks, mortar, artillery, including multiple launch rocket systems in areas where they should not be, as agreed in Minsk, in engagement distance. We see that the sites are in many areas at the contact line far too close. In fact, in all of the areas where we have seen in the past year, in this year, fighting, the sites are standing too close. And we see not only old minefields, but we see that the sites continue to lay new minefields. What is happening now with this harvest ceasefire that I have referred to is a symptom treatment. It is an issuance of orders that admittedly, at least in the first couple of days, had been largely complied with, which also demonstrates that the sites have it absolutely in their control to end the fighting. But what it does not is addressing these root causes that bring and have brought this instability to the area. When you look about the excess, it's already wild since we're talking about opportunity for a special mentor mission um, to be at the Russian-Ukrainian border. So um, how successful or unsuccessful you are? Had anything changed within the last year? We do patrol towards that border uh, on a quite regular basis, uh, but the the problem is that until we get there, we pass through multiple checkpoints and by the time we arrive at these checkpoints, the people there, these armed men, they will know that we are coming, so anything that we see there is highly controlled. And because we are not allowed to establish permanent presences nearby in towns like Antratsit, Amrosivka, Novosovsk, nearby this unsecure border, we also have to return rather quickly back to the base in Luhansk, Donetsk or other locations. That means the time we can spend at the border is rather limited. What we have seen, in particular in this year, is a rather systematic refusal of armed men to let our patrols standing for longer times at these border crossing points, uh, our colleagues are then asked to move back. 
uh, at the distance from which uh, independent or complete and effective monitoring is not any longer possible. Uh, our monitors can only stay a few hours at a time at these border crossing points uh, if they are allowed to stay there. Uh, but once again, because of the distance they have to drive, because of the fact that it is known that they are arriving, anything our monitors see is likely highly controlled and cannot be described as effective and independent monitoring. Is it just solely political will to, for the, uh, the mission to have access? These armed men at these border crossing points or the armed men uh, at the checkpoints on the way to the border crossing points, they take orders, they do what they are told. And once again, the reason why we don't have access is also clear to us. It is because those that prevent us from accessing certain areas do not want us to see the reality on the ground. If we speak about the humanitarian uh, situation, in particularly on, on the um, not controlled territory by the Ukrainian government, you, your mission still has an opportunity to be in Donetsk, to be in Luhansk, to be in the region. So what are the most important things to know? Because this is a very precious information and there is very little information as the Ukrainian journalists are not allowed and there is less and less, how to say, the communication. For people, Ukrainians uh, on either side of the line, including on the non-government controlled side, that live close to the contact line, their biggest concern is their safety and security. They are exposed to daily shelling, daily firing, and exposed to mines and unexploded ordnance that are in the path of their way to work uh, in their fields they need to conduct their agricultural work. Um, it is on their way to school. Unexploded ordnance uh, lies around. Kids pick them up and are exposed to these dangerous objects. Today we're speaking about the conflict in Donbass very often just when there is an escalation, uh, but uh, that's important to remember that on a daily basis there are the sufferings of the uh, humans, there are the issues of the landmines, there are the issues of the everyday life. Um, however, we would like to know the general situation. What are the biggest challenges for the next years where we have to look? What's going on? 
Um, and to have this broader picture we have with us Alexander Hook, who is the principal deputy and the chief monitor for the special monitoring mission of the OSC. Um, so thanks a lot uh, us for joining. So, um, you know, we usually speak when something happens, but now uh, can you give us broader understanding? We come into the period of what is called bread ceasefire. Uh, we are in the period when people are remembering four years after the um, freeing Slavyansk and Kramatorsk. So what are you expecting uh, in uh, the, you know, this summer? What are the things you are looking at, first of all? Uh, what we have been seeing this year is what we have been seeing last year, is what we have been seeing the year before, with different numbers to different degrees, but for the same reasons. Uh, and these reasons, the military technical reasons, continue to exist on the ground. What we see at the moment is that the sites maintain weapons, heavy weapons, tanks, mortar, artillery, including multiple launch rocket systems in areas where they should not be, as agreed in Minsk, in engagement distance. We see that the sites are in many areas at the contact line far too close. In fact, in all of the areas where we have seen in the past year, in this year, fighting, the sites are standing too close and we see not only old minefields but we see that the sites continue to lay new minefields. What is happening now with this harvest ceasefire that I have referred to is a symptom treatment. It is an issuance of orders that admittedly, at least in the first couple of days, had been largely complied with, which also demonstrates that the sites have it absolutely in their control to end the fighting. But what it does not is addressing these root causes that bring and have brought this instability to the area. When you look about the excess, it's already wild since we are talking about opportunity for a special military mission um, to be at the Russian-Ukrainian border. So um, how successful or unsuccessful you are? Had anything changed within the last year? We do patrol towards that border. Uh, on a quite regular basis, uh, but the problem is that until we get there, we pass through multiple checkpoints and by the time we arrive at these checkpoints, the people there, these armed men, they will know that we are coming, so anything that we see there is highly controlled. And because we are not allowed to establish permanent presences nearby in towns like Antratsit, uh, Amrosivka, Novosovsk, uh, nearby this unsecure border, we also have to return rather quickly back to the base in Luhansk, Donetsk or other locations. That means the time we can spend at the border is rather limited. What we have seen, in particular in this year, is a rather systematic refusal of armed men to let our patrols standing for longer times at these border crossing points, uh, our colleagues are then asked to move back uh, at the distance from which uh, independent or complete and effective monitoring is not any longer possible. Uh, our monitors can only stay a few hours at a time at these border crossing points uh, if they are allowed to stay there. Uh, but once again, because of the distance they have to drive, because of the fact that it is known that they are arriving, anything our monitors see is likely highly controlled and cannot be described as effective and independent monitoring. Is it just solely political will to, for the, uh, the mission to have access? These armed men at these border crossing points or the armed men uh, at the checkpoints on the way to the border crossing points, they take orders, they do what they are told. And once again, the reason why we don't have access is also clear to us. It is because those that prevent us from accessing certain areas do not want us to see the reality on the ground. If we speak about the humanitarian uh, situation, in particular on, on the um, not controlled territory by the Ukrainian government, you, your mission still has an opportunity to be in Donetsk, to be in Luhansk, to be in the region. So what are the most important things to know? Because this is a very precious information and there is very little information as the Ukrainian journalists are not allowed and there is less and less, how to say, the communication. For people, Ukrainians uh, on either side of the line, including on the non-government controlled side, that live close to the contact line, their biggest concerns is their safety and security. They are exposed to daily shelling, daily firing and exposed to mines and unexploded ordnance that are in the path of their way to work uh, in their fields. They need to conduct their agricultural work. Um, it is on their way to school. Unexploded ordnance uh, lies around. Kids pick them up and are exposed to this dangerous object. So the threat uh, to life is one of the biggest concerns that these people have. Um, 
directly connected with that uh, is the concern of their freedom of movement to move around in these areas to access uh, shops, even on government-controlled area, because uh, especially when you live close to the contact line, the last checkpoint might be preventing you from getting out of these areas properly or only on foot, not with a car, and that also, of course, then prevents from getting access uh, or supplies back into these areas close to the contact line. And because the continued fighting destroys infrastructure, these people rely on electricity, water, gas, often these places are also without electricity and some of these interruptions have wide-reaching consequences, cascading consequences. Um, if you have no electricity in some of these villages, you can't refrigerate your food, you can't listen to the news, you can't charge your mobile phone, which in itself creates additional problems for these individuals. What is different, however, as you rightfully say, is that the information as how these people live there is scarcely available. I think we should all realise that despite the fact that the numbers may be the same, the developments may be the same and nothing really changes, the reality for these people that live there is every day different. They have a struggle since four years now to keep themselves uh, alive and keep themselves in the areas where they are currently residing in. And my final, very recent, so um, the Ukrainians are following news of regaining, as it is said by the government of the uh, town of Zalate 4. Uh, what we know, there was still before the Ukrainian army there, but this kind of, any kind of military movement um, made people frightened. They don't know what's going on. So was that position under the government, it, it was under the government control. That's, uh, so it's very hard to understand for the people the news. So did really the Ukrainian government move somewhere with its military forces? Well, the OIC Special Monitoring Mission has never reported that Solote 4 was controlled by the armed formation. Uh, in fact, uh, if you look back uh, in our reports this year, on every occasion we did uh, report about Solote 4, we said it was uh, controlled uh, by the government. Now, what is different in recent days uh, or, or weeks now is that we see more military hardware inside that specific settlement, more uh, armed personnel carriers uh, inside homes uh, or parts parked nearby homes. What is the life in the village, which used to be in the grey zone, but was reclaimed by the Ukrainian army? Yevdenne is situated 1.5 kilometers from the occupied Horlivka. For the last four years, it had been under the shelling, but it just this May when the residents started to flee. The village is inaccessible by the car. You can get there just by foot and if you're a local resident. Journalists must be escorted by the army, while Romanske team had managed to get there and talk to the locals. We finally arrived in the village Pivdenne, not far from the occupied city Horlivka, and here the army has negotiated a ceasefire between the two sides. This is called a green corridor and it lasts three hours. Now local residents, several dozen remain in Pivdenne, are gathering their things and getting ready to leave. Half of them are heading to Ukraine-controlled Toretsk, while some are leaving for non-government-controlled territory. Neighbouring Horlivka is 1.5 kilometres away. This is the first time since 2015 that people in Donbass are leaving their homes and fleeing. Granny Klava, who has lived in Pivdenne for over 50 years, is also gathering her possessions. I'm going to the house to get my carriage. What carriage? A small handcart. You live here? No, not anymore, but I have to pack my belongings to take them away. Are you planning to move somewhere else? Where else can I live? Is it safe to walk here? It's not mine? I don't know, honestly. Better ask the soldiers. I used to work at the Gagarin mine. We made tea for the miners. At that time, 1,500 miners worked the first shift. We made tea and they drank it. That's how I worked in the mine. 
Is the mine still operating or has it closed? It's completely ruined. There's nothing left, just columns. Come this way, come on. Don't be scared. Oh yeah, we're not scared. Granny Clava, is this where you live? This is where I lived. This was my house. Now it's falling to pieces. Here it's completely ruined. My children would visit. My daughter left just now. Lately she's been bringing me bread, everything. And I was fine like this, if not for the war. My husband died 20 years ago. Around New Year's, it will be 21. I lived alone. My children didn't abandon me, but it was still hard. I got used to it and made do somehow. But now, you know, I could use it, but I won't take it. I managed on my own, even carrying firewood. They helped me cook. I had 10 chickens, a cat, and a dog. Today, Granny Clava's son and daughter-in-law are taking her from Pivdenne to nearby Toretsk. Since the Ukrainian army has arrived, is the village accessible to locals? Are they allowed to drive in? Oh, driving is not allowed. Coming and going by car is not allowed. Only on foot. And even then, only in the morning, only in a hurry. What do you expect in these conditions? Everything is done in a rush. But today they gave you time to take your belongings. Yes, they provided a green corridor, so we came. We'll take whatever we can, and that's it. And where are you going? Let's just say nowhere. We'll rent an apartment. In Toretsk? Yes, our mom is here. We're just helping out and taking her to an apartment. Where, where will it be? We'll figure it out there. We won't leave her here. Did you write this on the fence? No, I wouldn't write that. Is this how they warned you about the landmines here? Yes. They could have come and asked, may we? And I would say yes, but only in the yard. Beyond that, no. <laughs> Granny Klava is leaving Pivdenne with her friend, Granny Lida. Girls, this is where I live, in this water. Where is this water from? It's drinking water. A pipe burst and it hasn't been repaired. In summer it's fine, but in the winter I have an iceberg. I'm always skiing or sledding. And the water is constantly flowing? Yes, for nearly five years now, since the war began. I took this as a memento. These are my grandchildren. How many children do you have? Three. Where do they live now? In Omsk, in Crimea. One died already. This is my granddaughter at work. This is my daughter. And this is me, still looking fine. We're going? Time to go? Yes, here we were 35. Okay, we're going. Where's Granny? Oh, when did she get in? Alexei Matsuka is uh, the head of the Donetsk Institute of Information, the well-known journalist and the founder and organizer of the Donbass Media Forum, which is already taking place for the fourth time. Uh, for the f it was already in Kiev, Mariupol, Slavyanogorsk, and now in Kharkiv. And um, the media you are running um, is trying to explain the situation both on the front line, on the smaller towns. That's what the most important uh, we can have when you have the journalist working on the ground, but as well on the occupied territory. So if we have, you know, if you're speaking to the general public, what are the most uh, crucial issues at this point uh, for the people living 
on the front line zone and also on the occupied territories. It could be different, but what you know from your journalistic expertise. Now people live in occupied territory as usual life. They build, they, you know, they systems, how they can survive on these conditions, how Russia supports them and, and uh, local businessmen build these bridges between economy of occupied territories and Russia Federation. And as we say about the people who live in gray, so-called gray zone, they, of course, it's, it's a my, my, minority groups who uh, live under attacks every day, and, but it's really minority because people relocated from, that, from these uh, risk zones every day, but they feel and they, that there, is, there are their homes and they want to come back. But, uh, you know, near, near uh, 50,000 people who live in the gray zone now and they sometimes when we ask them about what you need more in our, in our information materials and what maybe something special materials, they said that um, it is information without politics, politician, without politicians' opinions. From the media, from our media, and, uh, for example, for Grey Zone, people always ask me when all this finish and what, what, what will be tomorrow. What maybe who th who think what think in Western countries about it? It's the ma the most question that I heard on the cross line and checkpoints that I visit when I visited. But for instance, if we speak about the audience who would like to know what's going on in Donbass, what would you answer? You know that national polit politicians they ignore Donbass questions in their programs, and Donbass now it's very toxic like toxic object for domestic political questions and a lot of politicians use this in in their populism and uh, companies for voters it's not a question number one in national agenda today because voters who live in Donetsk and Luhansk they lost their right to vote and because if you if you don't have a a special document about your status IDP and you live in occupied territory and before elections you can't vote but you all you continue save your status as a, and your right to vote but you can't do this so uh, national politicians they ignore usually people who live on that. If we speak about the occupied territory um, what uh can people know about what's going on there at this stage? Besides, yes, there are the separatists who are running this territory. Yes, there are the threats to, you know, get arrested. Yes, there is no Ukrainian currency there. Uh, the region is becoming more and more isolated. I think that people concerned about the links with the Ukraine because, because it's very important for them to, to, to save this uh, connection. Because if you want to build your future in Donetsk, for example, a lot, pe a lot of people who uh, go to Russia and try to, 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 to get these documents from Russia Federation as a, as a Russia citizenship. But I think that a lot of people who want to continue their links with the Kyiv and Ukraine, and, but it's very difficult today. You know that you should spend five, six hours on the checkpoints in the queue when you want to cross this. And also, you should um, uh, give some proofs that you not support and you didn't support referendum uh, four years ago. And I think people concerned about it, how they can you know, how they can feel more, comfort, uh, more um, uh, uh, comfortable in their relations with Ukrainian authorities. Because you know that our society separate and our uh, politicians also separate on these questions. What, what the future of Donbass? Is it necessary to reintegrate this territory or we can separate it from, the, from Ukraine and other. So pe I think people are afraid that Kyiv forgot about Donetsk and Luhansk city and proposed to Moscow to, to organize their lives on that side. There was a decision of the TPR tribunal regarding you. 
uh, so what's that? I mean, there is no uh, kind of surprise uh, that the separatist um, leaders or like these these people are accusing uh, the journalists who are reporting on what's going on, even like when you're living on the Ukrainian control, government controlled territory. So uh, what this decision means, what that? It is decision for me that they present me for three years. But for me, you know, I, I, I can't say that it's very something that I can afraid this or that it's very seriously because I think it's also step in their domestic propaganda for their audience because they want to, you know, to create on the me this slogan that I am as an enemy for their state, for their people, for, for this uh, idea and others. And I think that uh, authorities, uh, self-proclaimed authorities, they just afraid us as an independent journalist and they try to create these possibilities for our for our difficult for our difficulties because you know people who collaborate with us in Donetsk and Luhansk cities they saw this decision and they think maybe it's not it's not safety for them and others. We are here at the Donbass Media Forum and uh, you know there are a lot of discussion about the journalism during the times of the war in Ukraine. So what are, what are the main trends at this point for the Ukrainian media covering the conflict? You know that uh, during these four years it's always discussion about uh, is it necessary for Ukrainian media feeling them as a patriotic media or independent media and this is just black and white rea reality I think. Uh, this year the main idea of the Donbass Media Forum is new challenges and possibilities for regional media because uh, regional media are more flexible, they can, Im they can adopt uh, uh, fast um, co uh, journalist ethic codes uh, faster than national media, for example. We want to speak about these very sensitive themes through these two days, and I hope that maybe we get from these positive feedbacks from local, local media outlets. Thank you. Thank you. July, uh, we are talking about the four years since the Ukrainian towns in the Donbas, Slavyansk and Kramatorsk had been freed by the Ukrainian army. Uh, since then, uh, we believe a lot had been rebuilt, but is it really the case? Are the people happy with what they have and what is the political situation there? Besides, 2018 uh, and 2019 would be a big election years for the Ukrainian public. We're speaking about both presidential and parliamentary elections. And obviously the war is a very, very important factor. But uh, what impact it has already in, in the Donbas uh, near the front line, we are happy here to have Andriy Romanenko, who is the coordinator of the Center of the Civic Control D. Kramatorsk, ex Kramatorsk. Uh, so, Andriy, um, na sam pored, uh, Andrei, it's been four years since the liberation of the cities of Kramatorsk and Slavyansk. Each year we draw some conclusions. We know that some things have been rebuilt, but nonetheless we still remember what happened, what didn't happen, what people are looking for the most, and what's been done about it. Where much has been rebuilt, restored, constructed anew. It probably isn't enough because to this day there aren't any good roads between Mariupol and Kramatorsk, since all the main roads previously went through Donetsk, which is now occupied. Here things are more or less good in terms of everyday life. If we talk about ideology, mentality, then unfortunately the inhabitants of Donbass are facing a real recoil. This is because that for the past four years not a single separatist mayor who had raised the Russian flag in the Donetsk region had been sentenced. Many of them continue to be mayors without a single criminal charge levied against them, while people who in 2014 had seized cities and helped separatist activities calmly walk free. Once more, it's starting to feel like those good old days of Viktor Yanukovych. In this sense, unfortunately, there hasn't been much in terms of visible progress in the course of four years after the liberation. 
What specific actions are awaited from the government? We saw how Avdiivka suffered for one and a half years from lack of water and electricity. We couldn't build gas pipelines, let them get through, etc. When they say that there isn't any money, in reality that's not true, because we need to remember that approximately 3 billion hryvnia were redistributed in the occupied territories, and this money was in the budget. So in reality, instead of dealing with water access, roads, transport, energy and some other basic things that people deal with every day, we're building parks which cost hundreds of millions, amusement parks, pools, building up schools which we don't really need. This is the skew that we're calling infrastructural projects, which are not really so. Hence why residents are very displeased and cynical about the situation, considering they have to see all this all the time. Talking about war threats, given that politicians in Kiev are often reluctant to speak about this, and yet there is still an understanding that there is a risk of an active military campaign. It's possible that there could be a new offensive, since we know that Kramatorsk, even in 2015 after its liberation, had been targeted several times. There is constantly information about it being shelled. If we're not talking about the contact line, for example in the city of Taretsk, which is on the contact line, then all the other cities have got gotten used to it. They're tired of living in fear. Besides everything else, people have realized that there is nowhere in Ukraine that is completely safe. Meaning, of course, Konstantinivka can be hit by Grad rockets, Kramatorsk could be hit by Smerch rockets. As for Kiev and Lviv, there are weapons that can reach them, especially those located on the territory of Russia. For that reason, in the past four years, Kramatorsk has gotten used to living. For that reason, in the past four years, Kramatorsk has gotten used to life in a peaceful rhythm. It seems to me that there isn't even talk of aerial bombardments, some sort of explosions in Bakhmut. The country is entering an election period, and the political autumn is starting to be active. The war has been an issue in all recent elections, and there is an understanding that each politician will in some way or another state their thoughts on it and what should be done. What do you think we should be looking out for now? What should we be paying attention to? Firstly, the main threat is the war itself. I'll remind you that at the time of the elections, a large portion of the Donetsk region was occupied and did not participate in the presidential elections. There were some separate areas in the western part of the region and in Mariupol where someone managed to vote. As for the political situation, I think that replacing the head of the region should already be begun by the president of Ukraine, because the previous governor, Pavel Zhibirsky, in terms of his personal qualities, was a very controversial figure, and in reality he hasn't united the elite around him. He hasn't spoken to the mayors of the cities, he was confrontational with them, and under these conditions, carrying out a decent electoral campaign would be very difficult for the incumbent president. Naturally, this vacuum would be quickly filled by former Party of Regions members who currently participate in various parties and have good connections in these cities. The Nashkrai party is becoming very influential on the territory of the Donetsk region. This is a party constituted by former members of the Party of Regions, and it is a apparently very close to the presidential administration. It's essentially a pro-presidential force with a less radical patriotic bent than the Petro Poroshenko bloc. It includes all the well-known functionaries. That is, in our city there is a known faction of Nash Krai, and these are, for all intents and purposes, former deputies of the party of regions. Among other things, we see a movement in Mariupol where half a million people are leaning towards the radical party. If you go there, you'll see how this party's leader, Oleg Dyashko, is congratulating everyone with everything that he can and he constantly meets with the mayor of the city. There's a rumor going around that for the next city council, the Metin Vest team will go together with the radical party. A Metin Vest is an enterprise owned by Donetsk-born oligarch Vinat Akhmetov. Yes, yes, yes. There's an overused phrase, city-forming enterprises for Mariupol. We don't understand yet whether this game is just for the next parliamentary and municipal elections or if it's to get Mariupol to support Alek Lyashko instead of the incumbent president. Are you talking about young activists, new political leaders or politicians who simply haven't had a chance to gain ground in the area? Because in Kyiv and other regions, there are young MPs already, and you're talking about all political elites, which has changed their political views and party association. 
In Mariupol, people do have power through the city council, which try to shake the city up. Slavyansk also has young, strong deputies. The question lies in how much this resonates with the opinions of the society, to the extent that society accepts them, because the last municipal elections were riding a wave of patriotism and a belief in change. Unfortunately, we aren't seeing any global changes, and that might play into the hand of populist forces because there is a pullback. Many people could say, we believed the intelligent people and nothing came of it. But here's a serious man who was talking about how tomorrow everything is going to be perfect, so I'll vote for him. And this is very dangerous. Unfortunately, very often young politicians conflict with local self-government and they aren't supported by executive powers. Unfortunately, the regional state administration for the past three years hasn't done anything to empower these people. There wasn't any kind of public dialogue. The governor could have said unambiguously that there are young politicians in the city and they are supported by the president and his subordinates. And I'm not only talking about younger politicians, but those with pro-European contemporary views. But unfortunately this has never happened and many of them gave up or changed sides because no one can fight forever or just got disappointed and gave up. This July we are remembering four years since the number of the Ukrainian towns in the Donbas, like Slavyansk, Kramatorsk, Lysychansk and Severodonetsk, were freed by the Ukrainian army after two months of the Russian-backed separatist occupation. Four years ago, local Luhansk drama and music theater moved to Severodonetsk. In the beginning, they had to rent premises at the nursery school. Now they have their own space. Romanska traveled to Severodonetsk to see what is the life of the local actors and see the premiere of the comic play. This is where we turn. Here, here, here. In 2014, everyone started leaving Luhansk, and I was invited to the city of Nizhyn. We received a warm welcome. I got the job at a local theatre where I stayed for almost a year. And then the Luhansk theatre moved here, to Severodonetsk, and began to reorganise the theatre to bring the company back together. So I decided to return. We were looking for a space for a long time and we were offered this nursery school and everyone agreed, since it's convenient, it's in the city centre. There are spaces, a hangar for storing the scenery, there are a number of workrooms that we used for building sets, sewing costumes, making props. And here, behind this door, was our rehearsal space. This is where our productions were made, where the dancers practiced. This is where we spent an entire year of our lives. Our sound technician is from the Donetsk Theatre. There were about 20, maybe a few more, internally displaced people working in our theatre. You know, when you don't have a permanent space, people come and go, come and go. But now we have a large troupe and we have a large repertoire. We are working, people are going to the theatre. This is how an actress goes to work, dragging suitcases. <laughs> In Luhansk, we had a regular audience. It was big. They knew their actors and our repertoire was varied, ranging from comedy to tragedy. The Kaidash's family, by the Ukrainian writer Ivan Nechoy Levitsky, was my favourite play and favourite role. I don't know. I miss it. I miss it very much. And who did she play? Mrs. Kaidash. <laughs> when we first entered the stage, it's small, it's very small and compact. In the House of Culture, where we were renting space, the stage was bigger. In Luhansk, it was bigger. Of course, at first, the dance numbers didn't fit, but it wasn't so bad. We've adapted now and everything is OK. I understand that now the audience doesn't really want to watch tragedies or dramas. They prefer comedies. Oh, 
I've had more than 50 roles in different plays since I've been working for a long time. It's not like I just started. And here we already have a lot of productions, a lot of roles. The company is small, so we have a lot of work to do. And this is how I make a cocktail. One should work in his or her profession, and where exactly one works makes no difference. Why did I return? This is my theatre. Maria Ristich is the regional director of Bern of Balkan Investigative Reporting Network, an important organization to investigate in also the war crimes, uh, in particular in the Balkans. But of course, in Ukraine, it's extremely interesting that they were making the stories, investigating the role of the Serbian fighters on the separatist-led territories in Donbass. So exactly at the Donbass Media Forum, uh, that's where we discuss. But uh, even more, we are also interested in uh, what's going on with the investigation of the war of the war crimes and in the end uh, does the justice come and how people see it uh, Maria thanks for uh, coming here and really there are some of the myth that and not just the myths we knew that there are foreign fighters especially from the countries uh, which uh, let's say feel some solidarity with Russia or some there was a historical connection so you made a story on the Serbian fighters uh, in the uh, Donbas. So how much do we know uh, about that? What is their role? What's happening with them now? There are um, no clear numbers how many people weren't there. Uh, what we at BN did is that we tried to trace uh, around 20 of them that we knew uh, that went from either Serbia or Bosnia uh, to uh, different parts of Ukraine to fight on um, the Russian side. And the um, interesting thing is how we actually got to uh, investigate these topics is that most of these fighters we actually knew from the Balkan Wars. So these uh, were experienced fighters fighting on different fronts, either in Croatia or in Bosnia, that we knew some of them from war crime trials uh, in Serbia, some from different reports. And then we uh, used actually Facebook to uh, trace where they are and what uh, uh, they are doing. Because during the Balkan Wars, uh, most of the fighters who fought in param different paramilitary units like to take pictures, uh, and a lot of these pictures back then in the 90s were not posted online, but they were saved on cameras and other things. Uh, however, they continued the same model in Ukrainian war. It's just that they were posting uh, pictures on Facebook and online uh, and basically bragging uh, how they are fighting and defending the Orthodox Brotherhood uh, and uh, the Russian uh, goal uh, in Ukraine. And most of them were quite open to speak about what they are doing in Ukraine because according to them none of the things that they were doing and fighting were not either illegal or considered wrong. Uh, they simply saw it as paying the debt of the Russian fighters that were fighting in the Balkan Wars. Uh, so at the beginning when this started, that was actually 2014, and then uh, beginning of 2015 and in between, actually Serbia adopted uh, the law criminalizing uh, foreign fighters uh, potentially fighting in the other conflicts, including Middle East and uh, Ukraine. So. This is where the problem actually uh, became for them to return to Serbia. And then we tried to trace those who returned. Some of them who returned were actually um, traced by the Serbian prosecution and made a plea bargains, most of them. And they either served uh, two to one year, depending uh, on, on the profile of uh, the fighters, but a lot of them 
uh, actually are still in Ukraine and some of them uh, are actually in the Wagner unit and we were able to trace them also um, in Syria. If we come about the Wagner unit, yes. what exactly do we know they were doing in Ukraine uh, about, apart from being present? What is interesting um, with Wagner is when you compare it with the Balkans, it's actually a very similar model that already existed um, in our war. So it's the unit that is paid by a state. Uh, or uh, different actors close to the state that has uh, very experienced fighters as part of the units and that goes from one conflict to the other and fights. How we actually reached to the Wagner is uh, that there was um, one very notorious unit in the Balkans called Arkan Fighters and uh, most of the fighters there were professional fighters. Uh, and we, through our investigation of war crimes, managed to have contact with some of them. And then um, we discovered that few of the former Arkan fighters are now in Russia. And then some other people who were trying to flee, to actually go to Ukraine to fight, were telling us, we are in contact with this and this person who is in Russia, he is the one who is helping us to reach to Ukraine. And then we discovered a network of a few fighters, already experienced fighters from the Balkans war, who are actually recruiting first group, uh, the people who already fought in the Balkan war and want to fight for money. And then the other group were actually uh, young people, usually members of different far right groups. Some of them actually football fans who for different reasons also decided to join them. So then when we discovered who are the key people in the Wagner unit from the Balkans, we contacted them and most of them of course denied that um, they uh, ever participated in any war, although we found some of their pictures in Ukraine. But what is interesting is that uh, our final proof uh, that they actually moved to Syria was when um, one of the Wagner members actually from the town of Novi Sad, which is a town in northern Serbia, actually died in the Syrian war. So his body was actually moved from Syria to uh, Novi Sad and the last trace we had from him is that he was in Moscow. So for us that was a clear proof of what several other people already told us is how is Wagner moving from one conflict to, to the other. We don't know exactly the number, but really it's about what are they doing. So really, are they more trainers? The group that is called the experienced fighters, the fighters from the Balkans. You have to know that there is, um, as I mentioned, this Arkan unit. So their model is basically the same. There is a part of the unit that trains uh, the... Um, the staff, the, the soldiers, and there is part of the unit that are actually soldiers. So even back in the Balkans, they had their own training camp, and from there they recruited the soldiers, and the soldiers were going there. So uh, in these training camps, there were several people who were like the leading members of the camp, and it appeared that uh, some of these members of the unit are actually now in Wagner, some of them as trainers, some of them as fighters. They would never say they train for a war, but um, if you know who these people were at the Balkan War, and if you have some other people who are claiming that they were their contacts to go to Ukraine, and that with them they actually reach out to Ukraine, and that they are their contact points, then it's also clear what is their role now. For instance, can you give us a couple of examples of the people, you know, whom you can say that their past is kind of dubious to know that what they are teaching here, let's say, that could be pretty, like, say, uh, questionable. Yes. So uh, one of them that we um, found is uh, Dragan Savicic, uh, and he is um, called Wolf. That's his uh, nickname. Uh, of course, I have to say that he denies everything. Um, he was a um, member of the Arkan unit in the early 90s. He fought in war in Bosnia. Uh, then he lived for a long time in Montenegro. 
And uh, while he was in Montenegro, he was actually indicted for uh, various criminal activities, uh, shooting, mafia wars, and things like that. However, he managed to escape Montenegro and fled to Russia. His official story is uh, that uh, in Russia he works for a construction company and that he never went uh, to any kind of uh, war. Some of them, for example, there was interesting case that I followed a case of a war crime trial in Serbia for Kosovo crimes. Uh, and I actually interviewed this also former member of the Arkan unit. Uh, and at one point of the trial, he just disappeared. Uh, and then uh, we managed to trace that he actually fled a war crime trial in Serbia and that he fled um, to Ukraine and uh, joined Wagner. But all other members that we talked were either former members of Arkan unit or uh, different paramilitaries or uh, different uh, members of the criminal gangs. That was the special edition of the Sunday show from Kharkiv and the Donbas Media Forum. Thank you for watching from the entire team of Romansk International. And for the full version of our reports and interviews, go to our webpage en.romansk.ua. Follow our social network, Twitter and Facebook, search Romansk International. We are there 24-7. As well, sign up for our brand new newsletter. With that, I say you goodbye. <laughs>